Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. Hey folks, so I've got Jaron Lucas with me today, and he is uh, the co-founder and CEO of a company called Yumwoof, which makes low carb uh, natural food, dog food, and, um, or real food, dog food. And uh, we, we're going to go and talk about that a little bit later, Jaron, but I, I would like to maybe start with how you how you decided that this was something that that you even wanted to do you know what what made you decide that uh, dogs needed to eat differently yeah well uh, first off thanks doug for having me on this podcast as a uh, fellow low carb person myself i uh, am happy to be speaking with the tribe of fellow believers and uh, you know i'm personally on keto 7 months a year uh, when I'm not on keto, I'm low carb. I'm just a big, big believer in it and, you know, have really seen the benefits of it myself, uh, transitioning from my former unhealthy lifestyle, ordering Postmates every night into one where, you know, I'm really starting to, uh, you know, a few years back, um, dive pretty obsessively into the NIH studies on nutrition and really um, started learning a lot about how the body works. Uh, you know, I, I consider this my mini PhD in, um, in biology and all sorts of stuff. So, um, you know, I previously came from a tech background and as well as my other two co-founders in Yum Wolf. And, you know, I think a few years ago, I just really started to realize that I wasn't fulfilled with what I was doing, um, you know, building a bunch of tech apps that I didn't feel like were making a big impact in the broad scheme of things. And I started to look at, you know, what, what did I feel was something that would make me feel differently? And, you know, a lot of this coincides with, again, me going off my Postmates diet into learning a lot about keto and uh, obsessively diving into the NIH science. Um, and at the same time, uh, putting this all together and starting to say, okay, well, the pet food industry is a very large industry with a lot of really terrible products in it, um, AKA dry kibble and, uh, feeling like we could do something better. And so, you know, I think we took a combination of our tech backgrounds and, uh, our business experience and decided to start a pet food company, um, you know, ultimately because we felt like we could, uh, create something more modern. And so we went back and we looked at all the NIH studies that have been done over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, to, to determine what kind of ingredients should be added to pet food it, that might be beneficial to dogs that like maybe other companies haven't done this type of research yet. And that's why you find in our, our food more antioxidants than any other brand, more MCT oil than any other brand. And, um, you know, there's a growing body of, of research that shows, you know, really interesting new ingredients that you can put in pet food. And um, I would add to that, that, you know, there's kind of an obvious side to this that I don't think will surprise anyone who's already part of a low carb diet, which is that highly processed food is not as good for our dogs as whole foods. And so that's really something that drives where we take our product development. Um, but, you know, there's even a study that we point to on our website that shows it compared uh, one group of dogs that ate a processed diet, aka dry kibble, and it compared that to dogs that ate a natural diet of whole foods. And unsurprisingly, the group of dogs who were eating whole foods had uh, doubled the microbiome diversity than the other dogs, which is a associated with greater longevity. So, you know, it's, it's things like that where, um, you know, we're really diving into the research and I think that it's, um, it's us trying to apply the, the latest, uh, nutrition evidence to dogs in order to fulfill our company mission of extending the, extending the health span of all dogs. You talk about, uh, real food. And I, I think we get this in, in the keto community as well as so, so, so some of the detractors, you know, but a potato is real food, right? But a dog's not supposed to eat it. So I was was never, um, I don't believe that a dog originally was going to dig up a potato and eat a potato, <laughs> right? Um, so um, 
but you talked to me a little bit earlier about the fact that that dogs in particular although you said that their their digestive systems are actually surprisingly similar to to humans but but they they don't go into ketosis in the same way that humans do but at the same time and you can maybe just talk about that a little bit but at the same time um getting them off the carbs and stuff seems to have the same health benefits for them as as it does for for humans yeah, well, first off, uh, there definitely is no scientific evidence to show that dogs were digging potatoes out of the ground and eating them. So uh, I'm with you there. And that, that your point there actually gets to one of my biggest pet peeves in the pet food industry right now, uh, which is the marketing lie that rice and potatoes are good for your dog, that those are uh, maybe gluten-free, natural um, carbohydrates that um, are for some reason healthy. And, and the fact is, is that, you know, they're just chains of simple sugar molecules that raise blood insulin levels and cause the same kind of damage in dogs as they do humans. Now, um, you know, the pet food industry uh, really started about 150 to 170 years ago. And uh, it really grew in kind of the mid 1900s. Um, you know, with that has come many marketing lies. And uh, with this fresh food trend, which uh, has really been evolving over the last five years, um, you know, I am the biggest fan of, of whole foods and, uh, you know, the fresher, the better. However, uh, when you, we actually did an analysis looking at uh, all the fresh food brands and what percent net carbs that they have, and it ranged from 30 Five percent to forty nine percent net carbs. Actually, the most expensive brand had forty nine percent net carbs in their dog food. So uh, when you when you look at that, um, and especially the fact that these are rice potatoes, and um, I think an additional side note with pet food, a lot of times it's also peas, peas and lentils. Um, you know, peas and lentils definitely not part of a keto diet, but um, in addition to that, also associated with it's called the DCM heart issue in dogs. And uh, essentially what happened is that it's believed, um, you know, we're, we're still researching this, but it's believed what happened. Um, um, hundreds of dogs died on uh, grain-free diets that had peas and, and legumes in them. And what's believed is that uh, they actually inhibit the uptake of taurine, uh, which then caused this fatal heart issue. And so you definitely don't want to see that in your dog's diet. We actually removed peas from our recipe last year. Um, you know, all these things take a lot of time, but that was, that became something that as I like really dove into what was happening, you know, we wanted to get that out of our recipe, but um, you still really aren't seeing that with a lot of the fresh food brands. And you know, I give it to them. It's hard, you know, it's hard being a DTC e-commerce company and trying to have profitability. But at the end of the day, rice and potatoes are simple carbohydrates that um, are a main cause uh, between that and their use in other dog food that have led to what is now 60% obesity rate in dogs. Um, obesity is caused by, you know, the uh, glucose insulin cycle that, you know, when dogs eat too much of it, they can't store it anymore in their fat cells. And after that accumulates and, you know, they've kind of hit their limit on fat cells. That's when diabetes starts and diabetes rates have almost doubled uh, over the last 20 years as well in dogs. So, um, you know, the, the, the evidence is there, um, you know, you're, you're not going to see too many dog food brands, uh, want to talk about it. But, um, you know, the, it, it's very concerning to me, uh, these stats that are, you know, apparent and, um, you know, we're, we're trying to create food for people who want something more natural, um, and, and ultimately something that's not going to cause long-term health issues in their dog. Um, and I'll, I'll just add one note that it's not only about not having long-term issues, but, um, it's about what can you do to extend your dog's lifespan? So, um, you know, I think there are several belief systems in the dog community. One is, uh, I, I would say one really big community is raw diet. While I have nothing against raw diet, um, and in, if you do raw diet, it really need, you need to make sure that the recipe is complete and balanced, meaning that like 
it's, it's at a minimum, it's going to be more like a head to toe type of diet. Like, you know, the organ meats have a lot of the necessary vitamins and minerals. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we can't just feed our dogs like, um, ground Turkey and call it a day because, um, you know, they will be deficient in many, many vitamins and minerals, but, um, but, you know, raw diet aside, that is in line with an, in a dog's ancestral diet, uh, which is great. So it's low carb. And, you know, uh, like you said, dogs weren't eating potatoes, uh, 40,000 years ago, but, um, we can look to things like, uh, what are the effects of antioxidants on in dogs and adding more antioxidants to their diet? And does that, especially in the polluted world that we live in now, um, might that help them live longer? And the answer is yes. Like there have been many, uh, studies done to show that, uh, dogs with more antioxidants in their diet, um, benefit. And, uh, one actually really interesting piece of research that I came across, uh, last week actually showed that, um, MCTs inhibit the, um, they, they basically inhibit free radicals as well in dogs. So, um, they kind of acted like an antioxidant in that way. Uh, and I found that to be very interesting because it just, it just shows that a lot of these, um, you know, I would say like more science back type ingredients that, uh, the keto community has really started to embrace over the last 10 years are showing all of these other benefits, including most recently in dogs, um, you know, kind of this inhibitory effect on free radicals. So you, you talked about um, the insulin glucose uh, thing and, and um, the fact that that seems to be similar to, to humans. So um, a lot of what, what I've learned about on, on the human side is that, you know, excessively high insulin and excessively high um, blood glucose is what leads down the road to insulin resistance and, and a you know, all the chronic diseases that eventually manifest themselves in, in one form or other in, in different human hosts. Um, so are we saying that, 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 that uh, at least that part of the mechanism is very similar to humans? Um, because we're talking about where they don't go into ketosis. And I'm interested to, to hear there as well, where, you know, in humans, basically when, when the, 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 um, the carbohydrate levels are low, then we start processing fats to create ketones and then we use those ketones to produce energy. But it is also yeah. possible that, well, not possible, it is also a fact that we can um, oxidize fat directly in the mitochondria to produce, to produce energy. And I've learned very recently that protein as well, at least certain of the amino acids are and can be um, oxidized directly um, by the mitochondria to produce energy. Um, what do you, I don't know how much research you've done on that, but because uh, if, if the dogs don't get into ketosis easily and they're not really producing a bunch of ketones, then how is it that they, um, they're surviving if we, if we cutting all the carbohydrates out of their food? Yeah, it's very interesting. It, it, it seems like dogs, uh, rely upon or have, an ability to use gluconeogenesis more than humans do. Um, so I think that that's a more regular part of, uh, of just their overall digestive system. Um, you know, I think what, what you and I were uh, mentioning offline, having a conversation about offline is that, um, in order for a dog to go into ketosis, they literally need to be starving for three days. So, you know, it's not quite the same as humans. In fact, that's another marketing lie of uh, some of the keto pet foods out there. Um, you know, it's, 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 I don't think that a dog is necessarily going to, um, it's, it's going to be better to feed your dog a dog food with 5% net carbs than one with 50% net carbs for sure. But, I think there's a lot more to the story than this because, you know, just giving them 5% a day net carbs doesn't put them into ketosis the same way as it does in humans. So, um, what there is research to show is that as you increase the carbohydrate percentage of a dog's diet, um, it is associated with greater diabetes, greater obesity. Um, so a lot of the negative things that we see in humans are replicated in animals. And so, um, I think that's a very important point. It shows that 
um, you know, in, in, in kind of my research, um, there's a lot more research that needs to be done, but I would say that if you compare studies, it would suggest that dogs should limit their carbohydrate intake to 20 to 30% of their diet. Um, I certainly try to limit it to 20% of my dog's diet if I can. And, um, you know, we've gotten our foods down to 16%, um, you know, and, and, and in addition to that, so, uh, for instance, MCT oils, uh, are directly converted into ketones in a dog's body. So, you know, kind of like we were talking about before some of these benefits that, um, you know, MCTs in particular have shown in dogs, um, you know, for epilepsy, for seizures, a lot of those are shared between dogs and humans. And that that's because of the similarity in how the liver is processing those, uh, those MCTs and the ketones. So, um, so, you know, I think, I, I guess my main message would be, um, you know, you kind of have to think about it for yourself, but just knowing that, uh, the, the keto thing isn't exactly the same in dogs, like keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that like, things like antioxidants might not be necessarily a huge part of a dog's diet, but like increased amounts of them are associated with, um, greater health, health span biomarkers across the board. Um, the hard thing about antioxidants with dogs actually is, uh, getting them to eat them because, uh, antioxidants are pretty bitter. And so, um, you know, as a dog food company, there's actually a balance. Um, I I've come to the conclusion that dogs actually hate cranberries, even though they're a great source of, um, of antioxidants. And so, um, just kind of a, an interesting tidbit to note there, but, um, you know, I think you can look to that. You can look to, uh, you know, there's even research, uh, being done right now on looking at some of the more other, let's call them non-food, um, molecules that, uh, such as NMN, uh, anything dealing with NAD, uh, NR, those are all things that like David Sinclair has really been researching. And, um, you know, there's, there's been some study on dogs that show a similar kind of impact. So, um, you know, again, it just, it just gets to the, uh, overall similarities in uh, the digestive system between humans and dogs. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I would, I would say that, you know, from my research, it's maybe 90% overlaps. Um, I think we were saying this before that, um, the way, the way to think about it is, um, if something is good for humans and an ingredient is also found to be safe and healthy for dogs, it almost always has the exact same benefits on dogs as it does in humans. Wow. So you've done all this research. And then at some point you decided things need to change. And so I need to go and produce uh, some dog food that has, that is healthier. And so that's how Yum Wolf um, came about. So maybe let's start talking about that now. Talk about um, what this company does and, and um, how, how your products have evolved. Cause I mean, what you started with and, and, and where you're kind of going now with the, you've got a range of products now. Yep. A growing range for sure. And, um, you know, this is really my passion. I, um, I, like I said, I wanted to do something that I found filling. I wanted to leave a mark on the world that I thought would be possible, uh, that would be more than possible would be, um, positive. And, you know, we, we looked at the pet food industry and just saw a lot of really bad products. Um, I had a growing kind of concern for my dog's health. Like I started off feeding him Merrick dry kibble thinking that because it had a lot of healthy looking, uh, hand-drawn ingredients on the front that I was doing something good for my dog. But, you know, again, um, with a lot of these big brand dog foods, you have a lot of meat meals in them. Uh, in fact, that's usually the second and third ingredient. And when you find on a dog food label, uh, the first ingredient maybe being beef, and then you find the second ingredient being beef meal. And then maybe the next one is like uh, chicken meal or fish meal. So um, usually what's happening there, it's not like beef is 70% of it. And then they throw in a little of the rest. Like, no, it, you can safely assume that all three are in equal quantities in the recipe. So 
Um, dog food companies are always trying to uh, reduce the cost of their number one most expensive ingredient. And they do that by beef byproducts that are, um, you know, in, in this case, they take the bones that are left over from normal meat production, they boil them, they grind them, they throw, put them through a lot of, um, a lot of different mechanical and chemical processes to uh, eventually end up with a protein source that can be used in dog food, not, not allowed by um, the FDA for human consumption. So, you know, the more I really learned about this, um, you know, I just said, like, let's make dog food that gets back to whole ingredients, but make it as convenient as possible. So um, we took fresh ingredients and we um, basically got really creative with natural humectants um, in which, uh, well, that's a whole other science topic, but um, basically humectants uh, can be even something like eggs. So. Um, you know, we got really creative with natural humectants in order to create uh, a food that has a one-year shelf life without any artificial preservatives. That was kind of where we took our tech background and applied it to the dog, dog food industry. And that, that's where we ended up with Perfect Kibble, which, like I mentioned, it uh, has more MCTs and antioxidants than any other dog food, um, all natural ingredients. And, um, you know, we followed that up with Perfect Dog Food Mix, which um, was basically me um, as a pet parent wanting, you know, I was getting really into making homemade food for myself. So I, of course I said, well, I want to do the same for my dog. And, um, so I started playing around with a lot of competitors products. Um, I got really tired of chopping carrots and, um, ultimately I just found them really hard to use. So we wanted to create something that is just like two ingredients, mix ground beef or chicken or turkey with our mix and put in the oven or serve it raw and you're done. So, um, you know, I think we wanted to create something that's really for more of like maybe people who believe in whole 30 or that kind of, uh, mindset that that's where we came out with our second product. And then, and, um, you know, we, we've launched a couple of toppers, like, um, uh, really, really things that are, um, uh, like hugely researched, uh, across studies have shown positive benefits, probiotics and salmon oil are like, um, the top two, especially um, the research that's been done with puppies shows that um, both probiotics, uh, well, probiotics in particular had um, positive long-term effects uh, for puppies who were fed probiotics versus those who were not. So, um, you know, that's very interesting because it showed that um, they, they led to prolonged increased microbiome diversity, which of course, again, is associated with a uh, longer lifespan. And, um, you know, the salmon oil, well, the, the DHA is like, um, essential for dogs brain growth. So, um, if you want a smarter dog, uh, to start, but I mean, there are lots of other reasons why DHA is really important and that's in salmon oil. So, um, but you know, one of the products that I'm really excited about is, um, perfect superfood that we're working on. And, that's like a lot of really interesting ingredients. Um, again, when I, you know, when you look at things like ashwagandha or you look at rosehip or grapeseed oil, stuff like that, um, you know, again, a lot of those benefits do transfer over into dogs. So we're creating a really cool um, topper that uh, either people who like aren't, aren't willing to put a higher budget on their dog's food and are still sticking with the dry kibble for them. We're trying to provide an option that and this is going to launch in a couple of months here, but we're trying to give them an option where they will be able to get a lot of the same health benefits of fresh food because they're getting these vitamins and minerals from natural sources in a minimally processed way. Um, more like by freeze drying and air drying and dehydration versus like putting them through a hot extruder, uh, which I want to get back to in a second, the manufacturing process of kibble, because I think it shows how, um, how kind of bad for our dogs dry kibble is, but, um, you know, that gets to kind of, uh, I would say like the last, the last really important thing about how we do all of our food, but with perfect kibble in particular, um, you know, we created a, a manufacturing process where, um, it actually, doesn't go through that hot extrusion process. So, you know, it's all slow cooked at low heat in order to not break down the vitamins and minerals, which is um, what you see. So with these 
hot extruder machines, which I'm sure many people listening haven't heard of. But um, this is a machine where you put a bunch of ingredients inside and then it, uh, it has like a grinding mechanism to push all the food through. And so at high heat, at 450 degrees, super high pressure and this grinding action, it's pushing the food out and cooking it at the same time. And then it like put like spits it out like a bullet into pellets. Um, through that process, you are degrading the, all of the vitamins and minerals in the dog food. So, um, you know, that, that's just one additional reason, uh, you know, why we wanted to create something different is just the more that you learn about, uh, the majority of products currently on the market that they are cheap, but they're cheap for a reason. And so, you know, we wanted to serve uh, people who, you know, believe in fresh food, but um, maybe you're a little busier and, um, you know, trying to help those kinds of people who are, um, you know, very active, but also care about their dog's health, um, provide new products. What about um, the whole, like with humans that um, one of the big things when we eat a lot of carbs is that it causes a big rise in insulin, um, which lowers the, the blood glucose levels often too much. And then um, you get really, really hungry again. And so you, you, you're craving more carbohydrates and it just gets in this, in this vicious cycle. Do you, are you finding that the, the similar sort of thing happens with the dogs as well? That they, and the reason I was asking that is because people find when they go on keto, that um or they go and low carb that they not as hungry anymore and they don't even though they may be eating slightly more expensive food they're eating it's much more nutrient dense they're eating less of it um and so overall and then and eating a lot less frequently so overall they're not spending as much on on food um mm -hmm. is that something that might be similar with the dogs yeah, it is. And it has been replicated across many studies that showed how a high carb diet was associated with uh, greater obesity, obesity being the symptom of the process that you're talking about. Now, um, more and more people, I am a huge proponent of intermittent fasting for dogs. Again, all the same benefits it has for you, it also has for your dog. And so this idea that like we need to feed our dog three times a day, we can imagine who might be incentivized to tell us that, you know, exactly. do dogs, dogs didn't grow up uh, in their ancestral history eating three meals a day. You know, they lived by starvation at times, they lived by feast and famine. And uh, so replicating that in dogs you know, has all the same kind of, uh, uh, health, health span extending effects as it does for humans. And so with that, you know, finding a nutrient dog, nutrient dense dog food becomes very important. Um, and, uh, one, one way to do that is, uh, you can just, uh, try to avoid rice and potato on the ingredient list because you already know that those are empty calorie fillers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, um, this, this is like just um, amazing, uh, information, I think for people that, that have dogs, um, I'll put a, a, a link to, to how they can, can find you in, uh, in the show notes, but maybe you want to just, uh, quickly, um, tell people how they can learn more about, about what you do and, and, and maybe f find some of your products. Yeah. Well, uh, first off, thanks again for having me. The way I would love for people listening to get involved is actually to sign our petition or consider signing it um, around honesty and pet food. So you can go to yumwolf.com slash honesty. And basically of the three macronutrients that exist, protein, fat, and carbohydrates, only two of them, and I'll let you, the audience, guess which two protein and fat are required to be listed uh, by the regulators uh, who uh, regulate pet food. So, uh, you know, carbohydrates are 40 to 70% of most dog food out there. So uh, we want that to be listed on pet food labels. Um, you know, that's why we've called this honesty in pet food. And 
um, you know, th this is a topic that's really important to me because it, it just goes back to, um, you know, the largest pet food companies who manufacture dry kibble uh, are, are also effectively in control of the regulating body in pet food. Um, I think that a grassroots a grassroots action is really the only way that we can achieve change here. And like I said, um, the, the number one ingredient, 40 to 70% of the food itself should be listed on the label. So um, anyone who uh, vibes with that kind of cause, uh, you can sign the petition at yumwolf.com slash honesty. And, um, you know, besides that, I am uh, open. If, if anyone has any questions, uh, you know, just reach out to me and, um, you know, I'm Jaron Lucas on Instagram. Uh, we're also Yum Wolf on Instagram. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to say, uh, you know, keep doing your own research. Uh, most of it shows that, you know, there are a lot of these same health benefits that, um, you know, we are finding for ourselves as we go deeper into our low carb journey, all those same benefits, 95% of those same benefits also apply to our dogs. So just keep doing your own research and, um, you know, build your own dog's diet around that. Okay. That's an awesome way to end, man. Thank you very much. It was really, really cool. And I, hopefully we'll see you at an, at an event sometime, maybe even San Diego sometime or whatever, and we can have a breakout talk and you can teach people more about uh, feeding their dogs real food. Yeah. I'd love to please, um, please keep me posted and, um, and uh, we'll definitely want to participate. Okay. Awesome, man. Thanks very much. You've been listening to an episode of the low carb USA podcast. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lowcarbusa.